So um, the specific theme for this evening is education. However, before that, I'm going to give you a bit more of a general idea as to why there is a convention, what it does or what it plans to do, and also, most importantly, how disabled persons and their allies, such as their family members, can be or should be part and parcel of this process. So first and foremost, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was signed in 2006. So it's a relatively recent document. Um, Ireland ratified the convention in 2018. So from that point on, its provisions were actually applicable on Irish territory. Um, education is one of the key aspects that's dealt with by the convention. So that's Article 24 of the convention. However, um, you can't just see that article on its own, but it has to be seen holistically within the whole um, scope of the convention itself. So what the convention itself does, so it's not directly applicable, it's not a law in itself. So it's basically um, a framework document, it's kind of, let's say, a um, set of guidelines, so to say, as to um, how a country should best um, adapt its legislation and its policies to ensure that the rights of disabled persons um, and also their families are respected with respect to a number of different areas. So um, if you look at the convention itself, um, it's actually not a very long document, but then again, it can get pretty technical. And sometimes it is also very vague, which, uh, so the devil is really in the detail. And that is why we really have to see what the convention really means and uh, how exactly um, it is actually affecting um, people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So at the very beginning, the convention like speaks about a number of general principles and also general obligations. Um, so for example, you have um, concepts such as um, the equalization of everybody's rights, um, the obligation not to discriminate, the obligation to ensure that they have like uh, adequate supports. For example, if you use assistive devices, um, you should be able to use them in the classroom, at the workplace. So to make sure that um, notwithstanding a person's disability, um like every person can have the same opportunities within society um every disabled person has the same opportunities within society as a non-disabled person so one very important um uh, element underpinning the convention is that of the social model of disability so um it is very important and i will actually also link into education and to the iris situation here um that we shouldn't just look at a person's impairment for example, if you have a blind student or have an autistic student, you don't just look at the autism or like the blindness and see how that is actually impacting a person's education, but you also see what the social barriers are. So yes, if a person has certain challenges because of an impairment, then that should be taken into um, account. However, the convention focuses most on, okay, how is a person being not allowed to participate fully in society? due to the barriers that society creates. So I could be blind, but on the other hand, I might not be able to participate in the classroom or let's say in daily life, just because um, the school I attend is not accessible or else be, um, at the workplace, I'm not given the right environment to be able to work in. So it's very important that the social model of disability underpins the convention and with the UN committee, um, on the rights of persons with disabilities, which is basically um, a group of 15 experts at UN level who actually assess how the convention is being implemented in different countries around the world. And um, they also review from time to time the progress that every like country makes in this respect. So they will actually look at the social model and they will like see whether Ireland or Malta or any other country is actually living up to the social model of disability. There's a very strong um, focus on the participation of persons with disabilities in the whole process of review, but also in implementation of um, legislation and implementation of policy. <clears throat> in fact, the underpinning like concept of the convention is nothing about us without us. Um, the whole point of the convention was to empower disabled persons, and the convention speaks very strongly that uh, in Article 4 that in every law, in every policy that is actually made, um, disabled persons like should be involved or, or their families or their representatives um, should be involved at every like step um, of every relevant process. 
So what will happen now with the whole review process? So what happens is that every few years, every country that would have ratified the UN Convention um, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities will have to submit a report to the United Nations. So uh, with the Irish government, it has prepared a draft of this report. It is currently open for consultation. Um, they are listening also to civil society um, input, also to the input of disabled persons and their families. Um, there's a deadline for that. And uh, once this uh, feedback has been received, they are obliged, at least on paper, to factor that feedback in and then like submit a final report to the United Nations. However, going by experience, um, what happened, let's say, with a number of other countries. I mean, from my end, I was actually involved in the reporting process for uh, Malta when Malta was involved, was reviewed by the UN committee. Like, the government would obviously want to paint as nice a picture as possible as to what is happening. So they might paper over, let's say, certain things. So there's always possibility of a shadow report, one or more shadow reports. So we have the state's report on the one hand. And then on the other hand, you would also have these reports usually you have civil society federations with many countries you have a national disability federation that like provides a shadow report and then there would also be let's say the national human rights institution of the country which in ireland is the human rights and equality commission they will also have their own shadow report and then um, different actors are allowed to also um, petition the un and submit their own uh, reports. For example, the European Union Fundamental Rights Agency regularly does this with a number of countries when it comes to EU countries. So at this point, um, it is important to understand, um, and I'll go into more detail now also, about the specific provisions that underpin education. But it's also important to understand like what's happening in this process. So at this point, we have to make sure that um, we see what the Irish government is actually presenting in terms of its progress in the field of education, but you will also be able to put your views forward. So at this point, there's um, a DPO coalition in Ireland. Um, uh, Gavin will also like say a few more words about that. So they are like working to bring together a number of different stakeholders, um, both organizations, but also the in different individual disabled persons and um, their um, allies, basically, to be able to have as broad an overview as possible. So even, for example, with this focus group uh, today, after giving you, like, say, a bit of a taste of what the convention says and of what has been said so far, we want to listen to your own points of view. So then we can actually match what's actually happening on the ground, what was actually prescribed in the convention, and also in Irish legislation, see how that matches up, and be able to write a shadow report that shows the real situation and also counters what the Irish government will be saying in form of state report. Because even if there might be amendments to the state report before it's finalized for the consultation, most probably, as in as the case with many other countries, this will be, let's say, quite generous as to the government's record. So when it actually comes to what's really happening, to the concerns, the complaints of the disability community in Ireland, these have to be presented um, in parallel. What will happen then going forward is this. So the Irish government will submit its written report to the United Nations. Then different stakeholders will submit their own shadow reports. So that is the written review phase. And then you will have what's called a list of issues. So the, um, uh, UN, the UN committee, UNCRPD committee, will actually read through these materials and it will actually produce a questionnaire for the Irish government. So it will usually look at what the main concerns raised by civil society were in this process and also what its main concerns were for, in reading the report. For example, if they're actually reading about education and they have some concerns about um, inclusion, integration, they will actually have some pointed questions. They will do this as regards every substantive article of the convention, for example, employment, um, uh, accessibility, um, inclusion in political and public life, <clears throat> education, obviously. So um, there will be a number of uh, questions. It's usually quite a long list of questions. Then the Irish government would have a deadline to answer in writing to these questions. Um, it will also consult civil society um, in the process of doing this. Then there will be an oral review. 
this usually, uh, so the UN committee has a number of sessions, they meet in Geneva, um, uh, and in these sessions, I mean, nowadays it's done mostly online, obviously because of the pandemic. There would be representatives of the Irish government from different ministries, different departments, and they would actually um, answer questions there and then. There would be like four sessions of questions. And during the, these, this like oral review, there will also be a session with civil society. So the government will present an opening statement. The um, human rights body will also present, let's say, a countering statement. Then there will be questions to the government and also so be like a discussion session between the committee and civil society. The important thing, however, is this, the build-up. So to make sure that the list of issues will be representative enough and the questions of the committee will be representative enough, um, it is important that the input from civil society or the disability community happens now and happens as well as possible. Because then what happens is this, um, at the end of this um, review session, the oral review session, then there will be some oral conclusions made by the UN, but then they will actually issue written conclusions. They're called concluding observations. They're usually issued within one or two months of the end of the session, but it will be basically um, a to-do list for the Irish government. So then the next review will be in a few years because of the UN's backlog. Now it's at least six years in between one review and another, but although the process is not legally binding, so at the end of the day, I mean, there's no sanctions that the UN can impose if Ireland does not, let's say, fulfill its obligations under the convention. It's more of a name and shame thing at the end of the day, because these documents are public, so the Irish government's reports at this point will be public. Everything that you submit will be public, like the by way of shadow report, by way of comments, and also the transcripts and the video of the oral review will be public. Um, and the concluding observations will be public. So then the Irish government can be held to task, both at parliamentary level, also, let's say, um, by NGOs, like to actually answer to those concluding observations. So that's why it's very important that um, this process is like done very solidly now. One important thing I wanted to mention about the convention itself is this, that apart from the different um, specific uh, substantive articles that there are, for example, education or employment, and the general principles that I mentioned, for example, non-discrimination, participation by disabled persons in the process, there's also an additional document called the optional protocol. <clears throat> so um, this is a document that actually allows um, uh, residents of those countries who have ratified also the optional protocol to petition the UN committee directly in Geneva should they have any, uh, any qualms. Ireland ratified the convention, but it did not ratify the optional protocol. So um, this is something which um, the UN committee might bring up and which you as civil society representatives might also want to mention because basically it gives you one less area of recourse. So you can go through the Irish courts, if anything. Um, you can also petition the UN Special Rapporteur, who is basically the UN's regulator in the field of disability rights, who's also Irish right now, Professor Gerard Quinn. But there is, let's say, one less means of recourse like in place for this. Um, uh, like another important thing to keep in mind is the issue of declarations and the reservations of the convention. So whenever any country ratifies a UN a convention, I mean, there's no obligation to actually do this thing. So every country enters into the ratification process, so basically signing up to a treaty freely. So if a country technically wants to only implement half the convention, at the moment of signature and ratification, it can actually state that. There are certain fundamental articles, for example, you can't, let's say, say, I will not implement the article on equality and non-discrimination. But you could say, for example, in the case of Malta, Article 29, participation in political and public life. Malta has a reservation, unfortunately, when it comes to voting methods. Malta is a heavily politicized society, and because of that, Malta opted not to implement all of the accessible voting methods that are prescribed by the convention. With Ireland, it does have reservations, but it's on um, the issue of legal capacity. So basically, it still allows for substitute decision making in certain um, instances. For example, you, because of somebody's mental capacity, um, somebody else would be able to make decisions totally on behalf of another person. The convention, the UN convention states that you should have, have co-decision making always depending on the extent of a person's mental capacity. 
while with Ireland, it actually reserved the right to have full subsidy decision making. And also when it comes to involuntary committal of mental health um, uh, patients. So those are Ireland's um, like uh, reservations. And also when it comes to the issue of employment, um, it mentions the split forces and uh, for example, like the defense forces or the Guardi, and it mentions that in that case, um, Ireland is not like obliged to follow the non-discrimination um, provisions of the convention because there would be, let's say, um, an occupational requirement. But other than that, when it comes to education, there's, let's say, no specific reservations or declarations that Ireland has made in this respect. Um, maybe I'll pass over to Gavin for a while now, just so he could explain better what the DPO coalition is, who is in it, and also how it will involve you as end users, beneficiaries in the whole uh, review process. Thanks so much, Alistair. Um, actually, Adrian, maybe yourself would actually like to say a couple of words about that, if you'd like. Sure, that's no problem. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to cover a brief bit of what the, to the extent of what As I Am is involved in the shadow reporting process, and also just with our role within the DPO coalition as well. So the first thing I'm going to cover as well is just that within the shadow report as well, just a brief thing, just to clarify as well, the government department that's responsible for delivering the state report is the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth. And they're currently undergoing the reporting process for Ireland's first report to the CRPD committee, which is due to come to the community towards the latter half of 2021. So basically, the, the kind of reporting process that we're following is that we are for, since we ratified the convention in 2018, that the um, that we must submit a report within two years of ratifying the convention. And following the first report, Ireland will support submit a report every few, four years afterwards. So as we ratified it in 2018, because um, so our first report is due to come in at towards the end of 2021. And then following the first year's of recommendations, then we submitted it from every four um from four year, every four years after that. So naturally, as a consequence of this, the draft report of the Ireland draft report is quite big. It's 62 pages long. So basically what it sort of states out is it sort of sets out what the relevant laws and policies which apply to disabled people in Ireland. And also in terms of what kind of practices it has in place to support people with disabilities in order to exercise their rights. Um, it also records, it also kind of recovers things like resources, for instance, whether there's any grants that people with disabilities might apply for, or, and it also kind of covers different facilities that support disabled people, as well as sort of statistics, Irish um, statistics from the CSO and other organizations that cover the state of play with respect to disabled people. So basically what the state report does is that it covers costs, um, it covers each of the UN conventions articles as they appear. So when, so for example, if, it, if, it could, if uh, an issue kind of covers more than once, the state can kind of repeat those issues again, that, co that covers each section of the report that applies. So that's available on the Department of Children and um, Disability and Equality and um, Integration and Youth website, as well as all of the details that cover the, that also kind of cover the state reporting process. So within this, so within these two tracks, we cover, within the shadow reporting process, we cover, as I am, occupies two roles in the shadow reporting process. So the first thing that we did is that we successfully applied to be a grant funded member of the Disability Participation and Consultation Network. So this is the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth's way of ensuring that people with disabilities are actively consulted by the Irish government as they go through the reporting process. It is, it is a way that autistic people and the people that represent the autism community can have their voices, um, can have, and, and people with disabilities as well can have their voices, their experiences and the perspective heard throughout the reporting process. And it's also a way for people, and it's also kind of a way for people to, to, to directly tell the Irish government what their particular situation, what their situation is with respect to how their rights are exercised and, and vindicated. 
So as part of our role within our network, as I am, we'll be holding webinars like this on a number of issues outlined in the convention. So we have two outlined at the moment, which is education and healthcare, where we feel that the autistic community might have particular perspectives on these issues reflected in the Shadow Report and our recruitment. And within our engagement within the wider disability participation consultation network. So within that particular network itself, we also have members with it who, who have, um, you all, um, so we also have, we also have members within that. Um, so within that, we also have Inclusion Ireland. We also have Mental Health Reform, and we also have the DPO co the DPO coalition. So there's four members in total, and each of us will have directly engaged with the department as it goes through the reporting process. So the second role within the reporting process as well is. Within that mechanism, we're also part of the DPO coalition. So this is um, so basically to kind of roll it back a little bit. This is where disabled persons organisations. Um, so what that means, what a disabled persons organisation is, where these are rights based organisations, which are usually led, which are directed and governed by people with disabilities themselves. Um, they must have a significant membership of their board of their member a significant number of their members, whether it's through their staff, whether it's through a board, or whether it's by joining the organization themselves as volunteers or in any other capacity to be um, must also be pe persons with disabilities. So that's usually the requirement is usually around half or over. So this is so within that they're very much kind of so their kind of main purpose is to sort of relay the lived experience of people with disabilities and to advocate for their rights and to use that experience as a way of advocating for their rights so within an irish perspective as well we a number of dpos have decided to come together as part of the shadow reporting process to form to coalesce in order to, to um yeah, so it's to co um so it's in terms of kind of like the co in terms of coalesce so we decided to kind of coalesce um in order to develop Ireland's first shadow report to the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, as Alistair mentioned earlier. So that re so that is the so that is the mechanism for making sure that Ireland is accountable to the public and to the P and to the CRPD committee with respect to disability rights. So other members of the DPO coalition are, include Disabled Women's Ireland, which advocate for the rights of disabled women um, as a DPO, um, the Independent Living Movement, the Irish Deaf Society, which advocates for the deaf and harder for deaf and harder hearing people, the National Platform for Self Advocates, which is a disabled led self advocacy organization for people with intellectual disabilities. And voice of vision impairment, which advocates for people for blind and visually impaired people. So this is chaired by indep our independent chairperson and disability advocate Jackie Brown. So we kind of came together as there is no because with in the 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 history of disabled of persons organizations in Ireland, there hasn't been an umbrella group set up for this for this particular for the purposes of holding Ireland accountable on disability rights. And also that there hasn't been a national coalition prior to the DPO coalition, where numbers of where members who of where disability rights where people who where disability rights organisations have banded together in the under a common umbrella. So basically, what we're doing as well is just that in terms of wanting to be so we so what the DPO coalition wants to be is to be a strong collective voice for disabled people based on the guiding mantra of not, nothing about us or about us. So we want to kind of, if we, so what we want to is kind of show people, what we want to also, um, <clears throat> so we want to, so in the shadow reporting process, we want to very much kind of go through it from a rights-based process. And we also want to kind of reflect the lives, lived experiences of disabled people and our families in the shadow report. So basically the aim of it as Alistair mentioned, is to provide the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities with an accurate picture of what our what this what the state of play is with respect to Ireland's disability rights records, and to also make recommendations for the protection of disabled people's human rights. 
So what the shadow report allows people to do is to draw to the UN commission, committee's attention the issues to which the state has or has not addressed adequately to allow disabled people to exercise their rights fully. And also kind, and as Alistair mentioned as well, it provides an international platform for raising particular issues that pertain to autistic people, their families and wider, and within the disability community as well. It's a, it is an opportunity for people with disabilities to have their voice heard and an international platform for Ireland to to, to be held accountable with respect to its treatment of disability issues and disability rights. So what the so basically what we feed into the shadow report will have an impact of what the state will recommend and also, and also with regard to what kind of questions the committee will ask with regard to Irish with regard to our, with regard to the Irish situation and it also kind of has an effect on the kind of changes to laws and policies that the committee can recommend that could strengthen and vindicate the rights of people with disabilities over the long run. From within our perspective, we have a number of ways that we're going to do this. So within, we're asking people from this, from within a specific, so basically part, the second half of what we're hoping to do with respect of to hear from the autistic community is that if they have any issues that they want to hear with respect to the convention, that we will be accepting um, written submissions. So basically, to support, so basically, what we want to do with that is that we want to compile these submissions and to send them out to the DPO coalition so that they can be sent to the report, it's sent to the, they can be included in the shadow report. So th to this end, what, what, um, autist, any person who might be an autistic person or who might also be a family member can make a submission on any of the following topics. So this can also be so um, and what and and within that so that might be with, so you might be interested in equality and non discrimination to women with disabilities, children with disabilities, awareness raising, accessibility, right to life, um, equal recognition before the law, access to justice freedom, liberty and security, freedom from torture, freedom from exploitation of violence and abuse, um, protecting personal integrity, freedom of movement, living independently, um, freedom of opinion, right to privacy, the right to family, then there's education, there's health, there's habilitation and rehabilitation services. So um, then there's work and employment, um, adequate standard of living and social and uh, you can def and folks and um, thanks Adrian so much for that and you can send submission to us folks on any of those uh, topics um, at with submissions to at exercising as I am your rights oh, and yeah. exercising and also exercising services that are connect that are connected to the uh, that are also connected to this right so this can be this can kind of include what your feelings are with respect to full access to accessing your rights um what are some particular issues that have an effect on your ability to enjoy this right? Do you believe that you have the kind of choice and control over how you wish to exercise this right? What are some issues do you believe that are affecting the wider autistic community and how they wish to enjoy their rights? And finally, what are some things that Ireland can do to make this right more accessible to autistic people? So with regard to the kinds of submissions that we will hope to take is that we, we will be accepting submissions of up to a thousand words in length or we're also we will also be accepting audio and visual video recordings of up to 15 minutes in length so your submission can really help us to prioritize the voices of the autistic community um particularly with with regards to holding Ireland accountable for its compliance with the CRPD and we also wish to have the diversity of the autistic community reflected in our submission to the state report to the shadow report so if you want to have your perspective included, you can send your submissions along with the topic within the subject line to, sub to submissions at asiam.ie before the 8th of March 2021 for the shadow report. And with respect to, and also with respect to the DPO coalition's um, own sort of report way of feeding into that, into the shadow report that will be happening with that later in the year. 
So first, the first thing that the DPO coalition are planning is that they're hoping to conduct an online surveys with group questions into themes different to different aspects of the convention. And there will also be facilitating focus groups, uh, focus group discussion, in by which will be held by each DPO coalition co mem organization in May, that, and this will take place in May 2021. So with respect to what will happen to your confusion, that will kind of do what, um, so also with regard to the the researchers who will be writing for it on behalf of the EPO coalition will be compiling this, um, your submissions in throughout the consultation events and the surveys and the, Sorry, folks, I'm just mindful of our time here um, and that we still have a few things to get through with regards to Alistair speaking to Article 24 of the Convention. So if I could hand back to Alistair, if that's okay. Thanks so, so much, Adrian. That was really detailed. Um, and as he said, um, folks, you can submit any findings or thoughts that you have to ourselves at submissions at asiam.ie or if you'd like, you can send to me, you'll have my email address. Thank you so, so much, Adrian. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Gavin. I mean, maybe also what I could suggest would be this, that I know that Adrian has already shared some resources in the like chat box before. Um, if there's already, let's say, some materials or a specific link that could be referred to by those who want to contribute, those will be posted there or maybe afterwards as a follow up email to this webinar. There could be these materials attached there. So, for example, with things like video submissions or the word limit for submissions, these could be like outlined very specifically. But anyone who actually wants to make any submissions, especially after today's discussion, will be able to follow that. So, I will now focus more specifically on education and the convention. So, as I mentioned, so there's Article 24 of the convention, which is the main article which deals with this topic. However, as I also said, um, the convention is usually pretty vague. Remember, this was a compromise document that had to be agreed upon by more than 100 countries, a lot of chopping and changing. Um, so at the end of the day, it had to keep everybody happy. However, then again, the convention then took a bit more of a life of its own once it started to be implemented. Um, because with the CRPD committee, what they actually do on a regular basis is <clears throat> they pick the main articles of the convention. Um, there's a public consultation process whereby they um, solicit like input from different member states, also like from like different DPOs, especially disabled persons, and they come up with what's called a general comment. So basically, a general comment is a document. I've seen that also Adrian shared like some of these earlier. Um, uh, so general comment number four to the convention deals with the right to education, which is Article 24. They're always linked to an article. And these are interpretive documents which um, give a bit more flesh to the vague wording of the convention articles. So if, for example, the convention speaks about inclusion in education, the general comment will specify a bit more what inclusion means and give practical examples of um, how you know, like inclusion in education should really be implemented and how it should not. And this is a very brief side note. Right now, there's actually an open consultation by the CRPD committee on the next general comment, which will be on the right to work and employment. If anyone is interested, um, I can also, like, after the session, maybe even, like, give details about this. Um, uh, however, so, like, the Cerebral Committee always wants to vote, vote the voices of disabled persons and their allies. We're coming back to Article 24. So this process had happened a few years back, and we have this general comment on education. So I'll first um, run you through a few of the main points um, from Article 24. As I had mentioned, do bear in mind that um, Article 24 should be seen holistically. So in general principles, general obligations of the convention, you have, for example, the um, right to equity, um, the right to inclusion, empowerment. So any of the precepts of the convention should be couched within like this framework. However, more specifically, um, with Article 24, it focuses on the development of every person like the achievement of every person's potential. However, it also, in a way, touches on the whole concept, which the convention also does in other areas, of person-centeredness. 
So it's not just about everybody getting an education or about disabled persons also getting an education, but it is about that education being given in a person-centered way. So there have already been earlier um, international obligations which Ireland signed up to, which also like um, do like um, reference this. For example, the Convention on the Rights of the Child is another United Nations Human Rights Convention, which also um, alludes both in the text itself and in general comments there too, um, and the comments of the committee, which leads to that convention, on the need that an education is tailored um, towards bringing out the best in every individual child because everybody is different. So you have, yes, the needs of specific groups of disabled children in general, and also of specific groups of disabled children, those with intellectual disabilities, those who are autistic, but also like every autistic child is different, every disabled child is different. So it is important. The um, convention and also the general comment um, focuses on being able to make sure that every person, um, at least in, a, in an ideal world, because on the ground, as we'll also see through the discussion, it's very different. It would be per wonderful to have a society in which um, you, know, you have totally inclusive education, where everybody can get every support that they need, but then again, I mean, this is, let's say, the philosophy behind it, that everybody should have something which is tailored to their needs. But then again, we're kind of trying to find, let's say, a compromise on the middle ground. But yes, the convention speaks about this concept and also about it being, let's say, a springboard to participation. The convention focuses a lot on participation in society um, at every stage. So um, if you actually empower people, if you like um, develop their potential, if you give them the tools, if you give them the space, the ultimate aim will be for these persons um, to be able to participate in society on an equal basis with others. Um, one important thing is that Article 24 does not just focus on school education. I know that with many of you participating today, um, this will be your main focus. However, it also focuses on informal and non-formal education. So basically, both the link between school education, so formal education, and the transition to like, um, for example, tertiary education, and then also, let's say, um, skilling through other means, for example, continuous professional development on the workplace, but also, let's say, the school setting itself, and then both the convention, especially the general comment, are a bit more specific when it comes to things such as IEPs, individualized educational plans. Now, um, there are two, particular things which are takeaways from Article 24. First of all, uh, making sure that there is no exclusion. Um, and the counter to that would be to ensure inclusive education. And this is actually the burning point here. What is What does, let's say, the convention or what does the UNCRPD committee specifically um, understand by inclusion? Because this might be something where, um, let's say, discussion with Ireland might get a bit pointed. And secondly, the whole issue of supports. So when it comes to supports, we have to look at twin um, concepts, which the convention talks about in general, that of accessibility on the one hand, and that of reasonable accommodation on the other hand. So um, there's a, it might seem similar, but there's a marked difference. So with accessibility, or you also have the concept of universal design linked to this, and specifically in education, universal design for learning, UDL. It means that, okay, if I'm gonna go into a classroom, it should be, let's say, um, good enough for a kid who does not have any particular support needs, but also for an autistic kid who's overstimulated. So, for example, making sure the design is minimalist, make sure there's no clutter. So that's something which has to be done from the get-go. That's um, accessibility. But on the other hand, you have reasonable accommodations. So if you have a child, for example, who needs an SNA, special needs assistant, that's a reasonable accommodation. It's an add-on to ensure that you actually can enjoy that accessibility, or if a child uses an AAC device, um, augmented alternative communication device, or if a child needs a scribe, for example, because they have like a physical impairment, that's reasonable accommodation. Now, what the convention really emphasizes on is what are called ex ante obligations and ex post obligations in this respect. So, um, with ex ante obligations, means obligations which are there already beforehand. Um, you can't like say we're going to do it over a number of years. It has to be there from the very beginning. At least this is the convention's view on this, or the CRPD committee's view on this. What, how it's done in real life is different. But so the co committee and the convention insists that with um, uh, like 
accessibility, you should always plan that from the very beginning. If you're building a new school, if you're actually designing, let's say, a new program, you can't just like have the program and say, okay, how are we going to tweak it just to you know make it a bit better for the disabled kid? No, you have to design that from the very start. And if you have a system which is not accessible, you have to do your best to make it accessible. With reasonable recommendations, those come afterwards. Because sometimes with the best of efforts, you can't really, you know, like have covered everyone because some people have very specific needs, especially persons who have, let's say, complex um, support needs, for example, due to a medical condition um, that also, let's say, impinges on the disability, uh, maybe a rare medical condition. So in that case, you also have to make sure that these accommodations are given and are also, let's say, funded. So either that the state themselves itself um, provides, for example, tablets for kids to use in classrooms, or else that um, there aren't unnecessary barriers to this. For example, the costs of actually, let's say, having, let's say, additional support, be it, let's say, through a device, be it through, let's say, human support. Um, so that should like, never be neglected. Another very important thing is um, the focus on um, staff training that um, at the end of the day, not just specialized stuff like SNAs, but with the main staff in a school should be uh, sensitized enough when it comes to disability and the needs of disabled like children to make sure that they can support them, but also disabled teachers. Um, uh, the convention speaks about the fact that at the end of the day, like education is not just about teaching kids in school, it's also about making sure that disabled people can eventually grow up and um, become, let's say, educators themselves. And the system itself should both encourage um, the development of educators who are disabled, but also to support them properly. Now, I wanted to touch on two points as regards the general comments on education. There's a number of issues there, but I mean, inclusion is always a running theme. So there's the distinction between integration and inclusion. And like now coming to the Irish context, I'm sure we'll discuss this thing. So should everybody be in the same classroom, no matter what their support needs are? No, it's a very burning question. And the CRPD committee has very strong opinions about this. Um, so integration literally means lumping everyone together. Inclusion means doing it in a way in which um, you know, it is actually effective for the learner. And um, in fact, the CRPD committee speaks about effective access to education in a manner conducive to achieving the fullest possible social integration and individual development. So some people say that the CRPD committee, being, let's say, a group of basically 15 academics, sometimes live in an ivory tower. So they actually push the whole concept of making sure that if you can have kids in the same school, have them in the same school, even if you have, let's say, special classrooms, but they should be in the same school. Whether it's possible or not, then it is up to, you know, like every country to decide. And also, at the end of the day, every disabled person or every other disabled person to decide. So it's important whether or not you agree, even with the precepts being put down by the CRPD committee members themselves, like you have to put your voice out there, even if what you say flies in the face of, you know, established practice from the CRPD committee. It is your right, as the convention itself says, to put your voice out there. If you feel that what would work best for Ireland would be something different, then you should also like put this thing forward. However, basically, um, the CRPD committee, through this general comment, pushed the whole idea of inclusion as being something where everyone is like given the best possible um, um, chance for social integration. That's why they always emphasize, for example, having kids in the same school. But then again, um, there's a whole issue of be this manner being conducive. So we have to see in the Irish context what actually constitutes conducive. And then this is where the controversy comes in. It specifies that nobody should be excluded or let's say limited in their participation based on the degree of their impairments. So putting it very bluntly, um, we can't just let's say, OK, we're going to go to a special school because you are too disabled or you're too impaired. So, I mean, but it all, it always like depends. This um, thing was also written for some countries where there is, let's say, blanket exclusion. I mean, this is definitely not the case in Ireland. But then again, CRPD committee pushes for as much as possible having everyone under the same roof with different tracks, for example. 
and it also speaks about like not having raising the concept of somebody being non educable non educable because in some countries who just basically have special schools that are dumping around so they want to avoid that but on the other hand um, I know that was even this think, Irish Times article written by Adam Harris, where actually mentioned, okay, it would be great to have like this concept, but I mean, in practice, we, how far is it doable? Um, so yes, there is a confession obligation to actually work towards this stage. But then again, in the meantime, how are we going to do that thing? What roadmap is there? What does Ireland have in place? Are the laws like good enough? Do they need to be amended? So with special needs education, I have a 2004 law. I'm um, now it's 2021. So what needs to be changed? As I am also like made certain like um, comments about that, certain proposals. So this is what we have to discuss. So do keep in mind that the CRPD committee can be a bit dogmatic about things. The main aim for them is to have um, education is person-centered, to leave nobody behind, and to try to give everyone as much of, a, let's say, inclusive experience as possible. But then again, what is conducive to a child, or let's say to somebody who's growing up, what is not conducive? And also, very importantly, how shall we link to what happens next, transitions? Because um, it's good to focus on education, be it primary, secondary, tertiary, non-formal. But then again, how should we actually use this education? What about transitions to the real world? And how it happen in a way that actually respects a person's dignity? So you actually get an education that you can actually use. And this is one of the things that convention talks about. So do bear in mind, if your community wants to get an ideal, maybe in real life, that ideal is not as achievable or not achievable in the same way in different countries. But what we actually have to see is this, what is happening on the ground in Ireland? What are your concerns as disabled persons, autistic persons, and allies also? And what shall you put forward now as comments to the CRPD committee, through the DPO coalitions like Shadow Report and through As I Am, to make sure that the real situation on the ground in Ireland is actually put out there? Okay, I think that's it from my side with um, uh, like um, Article 24 and the uh, convention. I guess we can move to some Q&A then, Gavin. Brilliant, thanks so, so much. Um, I also appreciate that. Um, folks, um, if you'd like, uh, feel free to just make yourself visible if you're going to uh, ask a question and make sure to unmute yourself. The chat function is also free if you'd rather write your question, um, but just know that in the interest of time, it may be a bit of a pick and mix and that I might need to prioritize some questions over another. So we'll just open it to the floor. Whoever wants to ask the first question, please feel free. Okay. Um, no one has any questions now? Anyone? No, I suppose then maybe I, I can ask a question, I suppose. Um, Alistair, with regards to the uh, section on inclusive education and the full inclusion module, uh, uh, Vision, would you have any context that you could talk about? You know, could you talk about other countries that that's in place in? Yes, sure. So basically, many times the there's a number of countries that are used as models. Um, sometimes, um, funny enough, in a way, just also due to let's say their performance in other areas, Italy and Portugal are sometimes used as models. Um, uh, just because of the fact that the rate of um, putting students into special schools, especially at primary and secondary level, is like one of the lowest. And also, they have a system whereby um, there is, let's say, a lot of school inclusion. Basically, systems similar, let's say, to the New Brunswick model that was being like the, like discussed in Ireland. The thing is this: that I mean, uh, it can actually um, hide a lot of things under the surface. Portugal that does it a bit better than um, Italy, but then again, the fact that they're actually putting everybody together, it's a very fine line between integration and inclusion. So no country has actually got it like totally right. What the European Committee does emphasize is that special schools don't become dumping grounds, and especially if you have the possibility by making an effort 
to include more children, let's say, in the mainstream. Uh, but it doesn't li literally mean, okay, just because one of the things in Malta, for example, is this. You actually would have an SNA with the kid in class, you put them there, but they're not really getting much out of things. Um, may maybe, okay, they they'd be like participating, let's say, in break time, physical education classes, but that's it. However, this is why you actually have to see what is, let's say, needed for every specific child and what is not. So it's important that if you have opportunities for socialization or integration and not you know, sidelining these kids, you will do that. But then again, it's all about how you would actually address the specific needs of different children. So it has to be a mixture, really. Um, for example, in Malta, what they're trying to do now is a system of colleges. So you would have a number of different schools in an area, but a number of different schools for, so this is the public education system, was under a college. So they have their inclusion coordinator for that college. So even if, for example, um, you'll be assigned to school X, however, there will be some classes which, which will be shared. So even if, let's say, you'll be in school X for some lesson, school Y another lesson, but then again, within that same college, you are trying you know, to cover as many things as, uh, as, as possible. I mean, it's never a perfect system. Like Model still has a number of special schools called resource centers. But then again, so the committee will be a bit extreme on these things. As I said, they're academics who sometimes live in ivory tower. And then again, you can't really just like say, okay, let's just mainstream everyone. Because then again, what is mainstreaming? You have to see so some people just, it should be the minority, need, let's say, something which is a bit more specific. But the important thing is to make sure that if children are actually being put into different streams, it is not because the school or the education system or the government is not making an effort. It is because the effort has been made and has been decided that this would be the best consultation with the parents, having a proper, let's say, IEP system with proper like input and proper reviews, like um, in general from time to time. No one has perfected this, but more or less, this would be the model. So this year, the committee will anyway be critical of Ireland. I mean, I've seen the draft stage report so far, and the fact that, you know, even the word special education is used as a dirty word at, at UN level. But then again, it's all about ensuring that in the feedback which comes from the DPO coalition, you outline these things. You do mention that you are mindful of the, the convention's drive to ensure inclusion and ensure person centeredness, but you also have to like ask them to be mindful of the situation on the ground in Ireland and that it be tailored towards the needs of Irish society and also to the phase of development Ireland is currently in as regards well the sector. I see there's a question also. No. Uh, yes, I believe it says uh, Mon Nes Sheehan. Um, I'm yes, still... the fact like the lady here is actually hmm. mentioning the unrealistic view of the UNCRPD committee. It is unrealistic. Um, as I said, like there is this whole ivory tower thing. Um, and yes, I mean, some children like would benefit from a specific track of education. The important thing is then again, about making sure that if somebody is um, like in special education, um, they're not there because no efforts were made, but they are there because it was determined to be the best course of action and like, um, during that, let's say, um, the education experience, all efforts are being made to make sure that the child's needs and the child's dignity are being respected. So as long as this is outlined, that should be an important thing. You say the company will still have an issue with this. Because I'll speak with the Maltics, uh, the Maltics experience. So um, things were said in the state report, they were answered in the list of issues, um, but then again, the same questions were raised by the CRPD committee in the oral review and again written in the chair in the observations i mean i don't want to kind of let's say accuse anyone of anything but the company does have an agenda i mean let, let's be fair this has been seen with other countries the uk is like state reviewed happened slovenia state reviewed happened most state reviewed happened so at the end of the day they are going if they want to say something they're going to say something the important thing is this all documents as I said, are public so put things out there Make them as detailed as possible. So, whatever CRPD committee says, at least the views of civil society, the views of practitioners who work day to day in the setting, can actually be put out there, black and white. I mean, that's the most you can do. We have no control over what the final decision of CRPD committee will be in terms of observations, but at least we can put things out there. Brilliant. Um, thanks so much, Alistair, for those responses. Um, 
Okay, I'm just conscious that um, we're running a little bit over time here. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, does anyone else have any questions? Maybe we could wrap up uh, for our brief break moment, unless anyone wants to say something um, before we go off. No? Okay. Um, right. We will maybe meet back at 13 minutes past eight and we can move on to Elian's experiences. Um, thank you so, so much, Alistair, for that really detailed um, overview of the convention and of Article 27. That was really informative. And thank you to Adrian for outlining um, our uh, exams, um, contribution to the shadow report process in such detail and as well as that if anyone has any questions at all please feel free to let me know um, or to email submissions at asiam.ie okay folks we'll see you in 10 then uh, thanks so much again okay see you in a bit thanks. thank you
Okay, uh, thanks so much. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we will now move on to Elaine McGoldrick, who is very kindly agreed to join us and share some of her experiences. Elaine will be delivering a lot of her uh, notes through PowerPoint. So I don't know, Elaine, would you like to share the screen or are you okay with uh, sharing your, like, you know, just talking ad verbatim? Is that okay? You're on mute. You're on mute. Got there. Sorry about that. Uh, sh share the screen. Is that working yeah, sure. now? Yeah, I'll just make you the host here. Thank you. I'll mm -hmm. give it back, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> That's you. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, would, I need you to see screen two and not screen one. Any ideas? Sorry. If you're on screen one, then that's you. This is the one I want. Okay, gotcha this time, I think. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Elaine McGoldrick, and um, I'm going to kind of have apologize for the uh, PowerPoint because this was all very last minute, my involvement. So, Hopefully you'll forgive that and um, I'm going to take you kind of through time travel um, in terms of my uh, autistic teacher's perspective. Um, so first of all, she says, hoping the slides will work. Yes. Who am I? So I'm a late diagnosed autistic mom, a former primary school teacher and currently a UCC student. I have taught in disadvantaged in inner city primary schools, as well as special schools for children with moderate learning disabilities. I took time out when my children were young and returned to teaching as a shared resource teacher. And I recently retired early on health grounds. So on a personal level then, our town Clannacilty has been accredited Ireland's first autism friendly town. And I played an active part in this. I actually disclosed at a town meeting three days after being diagnosed. Um, as part of that initiative, I visited a large number of businesses and organisations to do sensory audits and found people genuinely wanted to understand how they could help. And for me, that willingness is the key to inclusion. So <laughs> I, this is me all through my life. And I think most uh, autistics identify with this, this idea of hiding in plain sight, that we're trying so hard to fit in, in a way that we were never meant to fit in. So um, it says here, despite his parents' reassurances, Bill couldn't shake the nagging suspicion he might be adopted. And I think for a lot of us who are autistic and haven't yet uh, been identified as such, then it can feel very much like we're Bill. Okay, so my school experience, I actually have very few memories of my primary school days. I know that I struggled to make or keep friends. I would have been highly sensitive, very easily bullied. My mum would tell you that I love to act out in front of a mirror. And I think I worked out a lot of facial expressions and eye contact and issues like that just by playing in the mirror. Um, I always played school with my dolls. That was my go to. I loved to sit beside someone who I could teach because it was underneath it all. I think teaching was always my special interest. And I also did a little bit of singing and dancing on stage, which was a fabulous escape. So secondary school and college, I was unfortunate to have to change schools. And again, we're back to the story, difficulties fitting in and, and like putting Trojan effort in all the time. And I think, you know, it's very often that we're caught between what please teachers and how we're likely to be liked by others, you know. Um, I put uh, clueless there, a letter to a friend, just to a, a very brief anecdote. Um, there were three of us that used to walk home from school and the first girl would leave and then the second girl would start criticising her, mocking her. And I just found that so difficult to handle and, and I really didn't know what to do about it. So I decided to write her a letter and ask her just to stop doing that. Needless to mention, it all blew up. There wasn't a happy ending and that was another friendship gone by the board. So, you know, in spite of all that, I loved fresh starts because to me, I was always hoping I was going to get a 
right the next time. I apologize. So in college, then, you know, it, you're all the time, I suppose, fighting with this sense that you've got to work harder than everybody else to just stay still. And for me, I, I have very vivid memories of um, waiting in line for lunch in college and thinking, you know, three to four students might fail this year. That gives me three to four chances, you know. Um, if only I could have flipped the narrative back then. But for the most part, I enjoyed college. But having said that, I haven't retained friends from that. Oh, come on. Yes. So then we'll say teaching. I definitely feel my years in front of the mirror would have helped greatly with my interviews. Um, another thing that we very often do as autistics is we script. So I would have practiced over the years so many different types of interview and it certainly helped when it came to it. Now, I would have struggled definitely with the social aspects with, within the teaching um, staff room, whatever, you know, and it's not that I felt excluded. I would have felt somewhat included, but I was just so conscious of getting things wrong. And there was a huge shame attached to that, you know, and I masked heavily and, and you know, to everybody else, I appeared so confident, you know, but, you know, I think in every environment we go into, we're constantly checking for clues, you know, am I doing okay? Am I getting it wrong? Am I speaking too much? Should I give someone else a turn? You know, it's endless, this kind of inner dialogue that's going on. Now, of course, I would hope to think that all of that experience gave me a huge affinity with the students who struggled. It was always my passion to sort of look for creative solutions. And I really loved the more holistic focus of special schools. Um, when I was teaching there and just I, I suppose I always was always busy creating new materials um, that would have been one of my interests at the time so when you know when it came to kind of married life and family life instinctively I knew I wouldn't be able to teach and parent um, I it, it just would have been too much for me to try and balance the two. Now, I would have been involved with the LH League and they very much are of the opinion that you follow the baby. And that that approach just suited me down to the ground. And then when I returned to teaching, I suppose a lot of the you know, staff room members or whatever, people would, would have commented that my approach was very different from other people's. You know, now for me, it was because connecting with the child was by far and away the most important aspect of my work, even if it wasn't, you know, laid out in any official document or whatever. So I felt I was bringing, you know, a more holistic approach into the mainstream because I had spent time in special schools. But for me, it's, you know, when, when the kids come to you, particularly as a resource teacher, you know, above all else, I want them to feel safe. I want them to know that they're accepted no matter what, and that whatever I give them to do, they will be capable of doing it. So it has been my motto for quite a while to kind of, to saturate those children with success because, you know, they're going, maybe possibly going back into a classroom then and facing all the challenges all over again. So for me, you know, I, this aspect of a safe place was, was hugely important. Um, I think this is a very important point to make. I had no idea I could be autistic. And this was despite lots of CPD in that area. I had a particular interest in autism and I would have read widely about it, you know. So I think that is very telling of our of our system. Now, bear in mind, folks, I'm talking about maybe, you know, eight, 10 years ago. So things have moved on. Now, the light bulb moment for me, um, I suppose, you know, there were so many common misconceptions about autism and the biggest one being that we have no empathy. So for me, it was, you know, there's no way I could be autistic. I, I cared too much. I mean, I, I was highly sensitive. And then the other thing was when I started to question, you know, I'd, I'd looked through all the characters and I couldn't find any sensory sensitivities. But what you've got to remember is my sensory sensitivities are my normal. 
So I really didn't have anything to compare with. Um, and I suppose we, you know, as undiagnosed autistics, we very often spend so much time trying to fit in and maybe playing down some of the issues that are going on for us because we see everybody around us is doing it and we have to push through, you know? So uh, later on when I did get to see OTs, you know, it, it was very clear. It, it was quite black and white at that point that yes, I did have, you know, heightened sensory sensitivities and I was quite a sensory avoider. So then researching for a student I had gave me my light bulb moment. Um, so basically I was, I had ordered a book in specially and I was reading through it. And by chapter two, I realized this is news to me. I never knew this. I didn't, what, you mean like, people could do things wrong and still be friends. I, it just, it was absolute news. And it was that, you know, light bulb in my head. You know, if I'm, you know, I was in my fifties at that stage and you're looking at it saying, if in the 50 years that I've been on this planet, that's never occurred to me, you know? And I was very, oh yes, the other one, um, sorry. I lost my train there for a moment, I'm back again. So this idea of the person, going to the group that was that blew my mind because I always waited to be invited you know and even you know speaking with my mum afterwards about this like she had no idea like they knew I was finding it difficult but it it never occurred to them that I actually needed help to figure out how to navigate all of this and how to deal with it I was very very lucky that just when I started to consider uh, that I could be autistic, I came across this wonderful group in Cork run by Fiona Quinn, the Cork Aspies Women Group. And it was life changing on a number of levels. Um, in one sense, for my, my kids who are autistic, uh, it gave me a very, very different viewpoint of uh, autism and people who thrive alongside um, you know, career-wise and all the rest of it. But as a result, of course, of that, then that sent me deep dive into all matters autistic and particularly around autis autism and women, you know. Um, I suppose we, nowadays we talk about, you know, there's a more external presentation of autism and then the more internalised one, you know, and I would definitely have been part of that group. So, um, you know, happy days, I found my tribe, I found people who spoke my language, understood my responses and reactions to things. And, you know, it really, really was tremendously, powerfully positive. Okay, come on. <laughs> oh, no, it doesn't want to move. There we go. The impact on my teaching. So in retrospect, I suppose my different approach was clearly my autistic logic. And, you know, where that, I would hope, was very beneficial to the students and to the parents that I would have been working alongside, having a different approach isn't always a popular place to be, you know. And I suppose there have been so many examples throughout my career of misunderstanding. And I've Damien Milton down here with the idea of double empathy. And I think it is such an important concept that very often um, very many educators aren't necessarily aware of. And that's that idea that uh, we can misunderstand each other, you know, that looking at somebody who is autistic from uh, uh, what we would call maybe the neurotypical point of view, you know, you cannot translate that behavior because it's autistic behavior. You know, and I suppose in, in terms of that big question, and are we working towards inclusion or integration? That's where this really, really matters. OK, so what's next? Uh, I'm going to kind of rather than I, I, I'm a bit nervous that I might sort of give away state secrets or whatever in terms of my career. So what I'm going to do instead is maybe look at some of the research that's coming out now. And in 2018, Goodall, um, I suppose he kind of put 
the dilemma into a nutshell when he said that inclusion was intended to replace integration or normalization, a process of placing children with SEN and disabilities with their so-called normal peers. Okay. And unfortunately, as, as recently as 2020, Rose and Shevlin uh, concluded from their study that very often um, Irish teachers approach inclusion from that integration mindset. So we know the CDPR has a beautiful definition of, uh, of inclusion, but I think, you know, in terms of bringing this forward, we have to ensure that there's meaningful participation of our autistic perspective in designing education symptoms. I suppose the best example I could give you there would be um, coming back to my moment myself. Um, I loved riding on the bus when it was rainy because it was absolute bliss and joy just to watch the raindrops coming down and which ones were going to meet up and which ones were, you know, this was heaven. Meanwhile, my mum is looking at me heartbroken because I'm one of three friends on the bus and the other two are chatting away. So, you know, from her neurotypical lens, this looked like I was, you know, being left out and it was, she felt so sorry for me. And all the while, I was heaven. <laughs> it was blissful, you know. So um, that's why I do feel that the having the autistic perspective of not just students, but also obviously teachers and SNAs and all school staff, the wider school community, we all need to be involved in this process, you know. Um, we're beginning to see, I suppose, even uh, with, with Damien Milton, as far back as 2014, the difficulty with autistic-led research. And of course, it's no more than my mum on that bus. It's very much. We have non-autistic interpretations of what behaviour should be and how we should fit in, you know. And very often, one of the, I suppose, really difficult things about um reading some of this research is <laughs> the, just the, the difficulty emotionally um, of reading descriptions of um, ourselves that aren't always terribly flattering, you know? And I suppose, you know, very important as well to mention the cost of autistic masking and autistic burnout, that all of this effort, like my little cat with the penguins, it comes a huge cost, you know. Um, I know for me personally, uh, you know, just the exhaustion at the end of the day, you know, and towards the end of my career, I, I would literally exist just to, to, for my schoolwork and home and collapse, you know. And I don't think people are aware of the, I suppose the cost of asking us or expecting us to be to just become like the normal person, to integrate with everybody else. And I think maybe if people did understand that, that they might feel quite differently about it. Okay. So we also, very recent research again by Rebecca Wood, this was in the UK, and she examined uh, the concept of noise within schools. I mean, schools by the very nature of noisy environments, there's no escaping that. But what she focused on was the noises that autistic students will make, you know? And those noises are efforts at communication, but they're not always seen as such. And I think she concluded in that report that very often, not only were we asking children to change their means of communication, we were actually asking them to, to modify it and modulate it as well. You know, so what she, she described one scene where um, a child who was non-speaking was brought to a choice board by his uh, teaching assistant and asked, show me what's next. Now, the child, of course, took this as an opportunity to do what he wanted to do next and chose out into the playground. And that wasn't what the adult wanted. So, you know, obviously the child was, the, the card was taken down and the right one was put up and the child was protesting. And in the context of that protest, Rebecca noticed that he was saying, no, don't want to. 
But the question, I suppose, really that that leaves us with is, you know, are we listening properly? Are we embracing opportunities for communication? Because, you know, we all want to be heard and we all need that autonomy, you know, and it's, I suppose, um, really what we need to do is replace this whole idea of a, a, the deficit narrative by a strengths and right-based one. Um, like we heard earlier, the idea of um, inclusion, uh, trumping integration. So there are a number of other um, research papers that, that might be of interest. Um, one uh, showed this idea that many of the best practice or evidence-based practice that we have been um, depending on have been questioned, you know, um, and very often in terms of errors of omission, uh, where perhaps a study, um, the authors didn't necessarily uh, declare a possible bias or um, there weren't accurate uh, records of things that may have gone wrong or longer term effects. And, you know, it, it, it's quite shocking, really. And I think a lot of that can be remedied with autistic participation. And we're so lucky, I, I think, you know, in the last number of years that there has been a great movement towards mainstream academia, realizing that it's quite, you know, that it's ethical to include autistics at every stage of um, their research program. So hopefully at some point we'll flip the balance, but um, just to give an idea of some of the other things, uh, how to teach people, autistic pupils by autistic pupils, do inclusion policies, deliver educational justice, do autistic children need autistic teachers? Now that's a, a very, very interesting project that's ongoing currently. So putting our best foot forward. Wood in 2019 asserts that teacher training alone is not adequate. Autistic representation is vital if we are to truly embrace inclusion. Diversity within a school staff is better placed to achieve inclusion. And we're not just talking about teachers here, we're talking about the wider community, the parents that will very often you know, very often you will find that there is a parent who also may be an undiagnosed autistic who's trying to deal with you as a school. And how are we welcoming those parents, you know? So again, we're back to the same story. Nothing about us without us. And I'm going to finish and I'm going to give the last word to one of the students. Um, these were uh, teenagers in Northern Ireland that Goodall interviewed. And he said, you know, when he was asked, like, what makes a good teacher? So he said, understand me when I'm angry, listen to me, understand me for me, don't hold grudges and be willing to work with me, take an interest in me, look after me in school and give me boundaries, change how you teach so I can learn. That's me. Okay. Thank you so, so much, William. That was fantastic. I like that quote. Okay. Uh, brilliant. How do, I, how do I give you back the power? So you go into <laughs> the more uh, option beside the share screen and it should go into participants. Gotcha. And then just hover by my name and then it should say make host. Oh dear. Hover by. Or should be a little ellipsis next to the mute button. Sorry, we'll try that. Sorry. That's no, okay. Uh, we should have practiced this, shouldn't we? <laughs> okay. I have security. I have participants. Chat. Yes, participants share did. participants. Is that the one? Okay. Yep. Then just so, find my name. Okay. Gotcha. 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 More. Yes, make host. Officially handing over. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you so, so much, Elaine. Uh, that was brilliant. I really appreciated that. Uh, thank you so, so much. Does anyone have any questions at all or any comments uh, that they might like to ask or raise? No, well then, uh, <laughs> then maybe I can ask a question then. Uh, just yeah. on that point of, you know, autistic teachers for autistic pupils, what mm. do you think of that personally? Oh, it's a no-brainer, you know. Um, I suppose over the course of my career, like there, there's so many examples of times where, how will I put it politely? Let's say um, a child is having a meltdown. Okay, mm. perfectly valid. And and for me, you know, as an autist, well, I didn't know then, but I know now. I would feel very strongly about the child being able to express this within the school environment mm. and go home safely having released it because I feel like you know when we're in that situation we have an opportunity an amazing opportunity to teach you know but if we're going to get you know, and it has happened to me that a principal walks past and the principal hears the shouting and you know uh, the response is I'll come in and I'll stamp my authority on this thing whereas you know, and in, invariably what happens then is that the child panics and would either go flight and disappear off and then it's a bigger issue again, you know. So, I, and again, this is just purely, you know, everybody has the best of intentions, but not everybody understands how we as autistics deal with those very, very high emotions. And more often than not, uh, what we need is someone to just sit beside us to be the calm in the storm, to say, look, I'm here for you now. When you're ready, we'll go and do whatever, you know, whatever sensory activity or, or is part of the plan, you know. But without autistic participation in teacher training, in schools in general, then that's missing, you know. So, yeah, that would be. Anyway, <laughs> I'll stop. No, that's a, yeah. that's a really, really good point. Uh, see, yeah. Danny has said um, that it would be amazing to see a school for neurodivergent kids staffed by neurodivergent mm. adults. Absolutely. And question from Nessa, Elaine, what advice would you have to help us teachers support parents in their journey through school? Yeah, that's a very important one. I think you need to look at all of the... Um, I suppose we were talking earlier about accessibility barriers and very often we stop at the physical accessibility where we really need to be looking at sensory and also at communication in terms of the difficulties that a parent may face in coming into the situation. So for one, I would think, you know, the busy, busy um, parent teacher meetings where maybe the parents are sitting in the corridors waiting to go in one to one, that can be so difficult you know on a sensory level you know you're you're in your within your head you know you're rehearsing this conversation how's the, you know you're anxious about the meeting you're going to have but you're also very conscious of the fact that maybe other people around you are looking at you you know kind of strange at you or want you to talk to them or making an effort like it's so I would suggest perhaps maybe communicating with the parent in terms of what they're you know inquiring what their preferences are how would they feel um what would suit them best and very often the other thing nasa would be uh, like to let us know in advance what we're going into you know because the that whole fear of the unknown that whole what's going to come up like it yeah that can also weigh very heavily on us you know okay. thank you thank you <laughs> yeah uh for martino here what is your view on social skills training in schools for children on the autism spectrum okay why can't we have social skills training for the non-autistic children in the classroom? Basically, you know, I mean, we know as autistics, when we sit down and we get together, <laughs> there are no issue with our social skills. You know, I, in fact, when my, one of mine was very young, I used to always sort of say, sure, if we lived on a desert island, they'd be perfect. It's only when you compare them to other people that there's an issue here, you know? So like, if we're looking at the school as being the place where our children learn about society and how society operates, then we should be, that this is the business of inclusion. You know, like without doubt, there are certain things that are very helpful for us to know when we have to start to deal with neurotypical events, but it should not be the primary focus. The primary focus should be on everybody else. 
my opinion. <laughs> As I say, it's not always popular, <laughs> but there you go. Well, it's still, it's a few just to get it out there. Uh, mm. Thanks so much. Mary Doherty asks, for those teachers who know they're autistic, but don't want to disclose, mm. what do you think would make it easier for them to open up? Yeah, it's a tricky one. You know, um, I suppose I was a bit foolhardy and I immediately disclosed, as I say, because of the opportunity in terms of, you know, awesome friendly town and clan and everything. But I was always amazed that people would come to me and say, God, you're so brave. And like very often, you know, no matter how intelligent we are, we can be very naive. And, you know, I think personally, like the whole idea of, um, somebody maybe thinking less of me or treating me different it just never crossed my mind you know which was completely naive of me so like we really really need a safe space for any autistic staff members and like I'm hugely interested in the work that Rebecca Wood is doing in the UK just to see where that goes but like there are some um online support groups, um, not Irish based, they're UK based, but we're very welcome to join them. So uh, if anybody wants to kind of contact me afterwards, I can perhaps make a couple of suggestions there. Yeah. Okay, um, that's brilliant. Um, would anyone else have anything they'd like to ask or any comments, queries for either Alistair or uh, Liam? Um, no, no, God. Uh, then it must have been a really well delivered message. Fair play, folks. <laughs> uh, thank you so, so much to our two speakers. Um, that was a lot, but it was so, so informative. I thought that was brilliant from both speakers. And I'm delighted that they were able to join us, especially Elaine on such short notice, and indeed Alistair, who's all the way in Malta. I'm conscious oh, that wow. it's approaching 10 o'clock now on his part of the world. Yeah. And it's late and Monday, so we're all exhausted. But thank you so, so much, everyone, to come, in, to come into this, and as well as that for taking part in our wider project in contributing to the Shadow Report on the UNCRPD. As I said at the beginning and in the middle, uh, if anyone has any thoughts or comments, suggestions, please feel free to email me at my email, um, which is gavin at asiam.ie. It should be, it'll be in your invites. Um, Likewise, on our website, um, it's there as well on the first thing that you click into on the news section. And the email address there is submissions at asiam.ie. The maximum length for a written submission is a thousand words, but you're under no obligation to write that long. It can be as long as short as you like. Likewise, if you'd rather do something visually, then recording an audio or a visual one is also welcome, 15 minutes long. Likewise, it doesn't have to be that long either as long as it's something that sets out what you think you think that Ireland should live up to and what you think the UNCRPD should be achieving in our policy and how you think it can help. Those are the main things. And we have a list of things as Adrian detailed in length earlier uh, on the website. So if anyone has any thoughts or suggestions or anything they'd like to ask, feel free to email me. So without further ado, thank you so, so much. The recording for this is gonna be put up on our website shortly after. Uh, this should be up by either tomorrow or at the very latest Wednesday. And on Wednesday, we will be joined again by Alistair and uh, we will be going over Article 25, which is healthcare. And we will be joined by Mary Doherty, who has uh, spoken a lot on this issue, especially in her own capacity as a doctor and indeed as an autistic advocate. So thanks so much, folks. Mind yourselves this evening and we'll chat soon. Cheerio then.